Well, good morning. Welcome to Western Avenue. We're glad that you have tuned in with us today. We want to wish you a happy Mother's Day for all the mothers out there. Um, we're glad that maybe you get to spend some time with your family. If you are able, we want to encourage you to get in touch with your mother, spend some time with her, call her, tell her that you love her and that you appreciate her um, and that you're thankful for her. We're thankful to be able to gather again today uh, online, um, and we have a, a great time of worship planned. We're going to continue our, our sermon series in Mark, but before we do that, I want to turn to Matthew and read this. This is Matthew chapter 11. It says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's our prayer for you today, that you would come to Jesus, that you would fall on Jesus, and that you would find rest. We invite you to join us in singing, I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. Sings my soul, my soul. 
the splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself. people think um to think before i say things be safe not to talk to strangers get back on when i fall off my bike um probably not to eat a lot of candy i would have her have blonde hair like me instead of brown her shoe size so that i could wear all her shoes. 
Nothing. Laughing really hard. Does she like to laugh really hard? Yeah. Yeah, who makes her laugh the most? William. William? <laughs> I bet he does. We are at the trampoline park and we try and she tried to go up the warp wall, but it ruptured her Achilles tendon. When she was four, she um was riding her bike and she accidentally rode over the cat's tail. Sometimes she'll do crazy dances. I don't know really what they're called, but she'll just do stuff. She'll jump up and around. Ask where her glasses was when they were on her face. Um, uh, the pie in the face one time with us. She was trying to get Madeline to eat her food, so she told her, "I will. Um, I'll do a crazy dance if you eat." She went. <laughs> To relax, my mom spends five hours looking at Facebook pictures. She likes to read a lot. Go to Goodwill. It's usually she's cooking. Like dinner, she's like busy. If she wants to be by herself, she lets us watch TV while she makes dinner. Sits down. <laughs> um, she gets a blanket and watches TV. I know my mom loves me because she takes care of me. Buys me donuts. Is my mom. Reads me stories at night. Cooks for me. At bedtime, she tucks me in. Plays with me in my bed. Feeds me. She helps me get through it when I'm crying. Keeps me safe. She kisses me. Um, she tells me that she loves me all the time. Happy Mother's Day. 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 And we do wish a very, very happy Mother's Day to all our mothers out there. You have shown yourself uh, maybe more than any time in our recent memory of how valuable you are and how we cannot get along without you during these last eight or so weeks of being quarantined and how you've held your family together and made the difference. And we are so thankful for all the moms that we have. And, and there are many that uh, as we get older, it, it might have been a long time since you've been able to even see your mother. Uh, and maybe you can't even do that today here on Mother's Day uh, because of trying to protect her. And I I want to just encourage you, as Mark said, to maybe give her a call, maybe do FaceTime if you can do that, and just let her know how much you do treasure her and how grateful you are for her, and to let her know how deeply, deeply loved that she is. Well, today we want to continue our time of worship. This is the, uh, we're, it's a Sunday where we're beginning to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. We've heard some recent declarations from our governor who's lessening the restrictions and entering into what we call phase one of reopening the state and, of course, reopening the churches very gradually. Uh, we want to do our best to do what's good and what's right and what's safe and, and what's practical. And so you'll be hearing more and more from us as we go through these phases as well. And it seems like things change almost daily. And so try to, we'll try to stay connected with you best we can through emails, through our social media, uh, through our newsletter. If you're not getting these or an email or newsletter, uh, then please call the church office and make sure that we have your address, make sure we have your email so that you can stay up to date on everything that's happening as things continue to change. As we go to the Lord in prayer, 
There are a few individuals that we want to make sure you do remember. Mike LaFone, still at Charlotte, uh, recovering from his surgery. And I know he and Judy would appreciate your prayers for him. And Gene Halp, he was able to have that second surgery that was interrupted last week. And he's resting now. He's also down in the Charlotte area and doing very well, I understand. And so we're very grateful for that. And then today, uh, earlier this week, rather, Hank Dahl uh, had surgery. And uh, he doesn't want anybody to know that, so don't tell anybody. Uh, but he's doing very well uh, after recovering from surgery on a, on a torn tendon. We do have some sad news that earlier this week, uh, Tracy Steichleather lost her father. And that's always a difficult time. No matter how prepared you are to lose a parent, it's still an incredibly difficult time when it happens. And so be in prayer for Tracy. And of course, last week, you know, we mentioned um, Cindy Haynes lost her mother. And here a couple days after that, it's Mother's Day. So be in prayer for Cindy and, and others who are going through a difficult time today. Let's go to our Lord in prayer now. Our Father God, we come to you now with many, many reasons to praise you and to thank you. You are so good to us in so many ways. And one of those ways for so very many of us is the gift that you've given us in our moms. On a day that's been set aside to honor them, uh, we lift up our prayers on behalf of them and also in praise and honor of them. We pray for those moms who are new moms, who are coming to terms with these new responsibilities, with all the joy that comes from bringing a, a little bundle home, and we pray you'd give them strength to rely on you. For, for moms who are expecting and who are wondering and waiting, that you would give them the ability to trust and wet rest and wait upon you. For moms who over the last couple of weeks have grown tired and stressed and maybe even depressed, that you would give them what they need to endure and to serve you and as they serve their families well and to point them to the one who has served them. We pray for moms who are struggling to balance the tasks of, of work, some that usually maybe work out of the home, now are working in the home, those who are working in the home and they see their workload increased that you would give them the perseverance they need, again, to glorify you in all places. We pray for moms out there who are raising children on their own and how difficult it must be these last several weeks. We ask that you would to remind them and teach them that you alone are our help and theirs and that we can realize that through your help uh, that comes from this body, their church, to let us rise up and help them as well when it is needed. We pray for moms who have who have lost children. I can't imagine the, the pain of, of thinking about such things and that you would give them the comfort and support they need in times of the, the, the greatest darkness uh, an individual can go through. May their hope be in you and their hope that in your grace and your mercy that they can see their precious one again. We pray for moms who have adopted children. Thank you so much for their open hearts. We pray for others who are the children of, uh, who care for the children of others as child care providers and as foster moms. Again, for the open hearts that dedicate themselves to loving, providing cares for those who might otherwise suffer greatly in this world. And Lord, we even pray for those in our congregation who desire to be a mother. And that desire has not yet been fulfilled for reasons possibly known only by you, that you would grant them what they need to fill their heart with the fact that they are indeed loved and you know and hear their t cries and their tears and pray that your will would be done and they could rest in that. We ask you please to bless all our moms and that their love may be deep and tender and, and truly reflect reflective of the love that you have for them and for us. Continue to strengthen them and equip them that they may lead their children to know you and follow you all the days of their life. Father, we thank you as we again say that we can see the light at the end of this long dark tunnel we've been in. And we know the day is coming where we'll be able to join in this room as the body of Christ to worship you together. The way it's supposed to be, the way it's intended, the way it only can be if we're to truly call ourselves a church. And so I pray you would keep us safe and healthy and well until that day, and that day would come quickly as you continue to do your work of stemming the tide of this, the increase in this virus, that it would not be able to continue to grow, that you would cease it in its tracks, and, and we would see a very steady and noticeable and marked decline in how others are being infected. And those who are dealing with it now, that you would give them the strength in their body to, to endure and make it through this time. And they would use this as you do all things that are good and bad in this world to draw people to you 
and to make yourself glorious before them. We pray again, as we always want to, for our doctors, our nurses, those who serve us in our EMTs and our police and deputies and troopers and, and all those who put their own lives at risk, that you would watch over them and keep them safe. And we pray that especially for those who have performed those duties as members of this church, that uh, we are grateful for their answer to your call. And we pray you'd help them to do their job well and may it bring glory to you as they do and point others to you. Lord, we pray for these medical researchers that you would grant them the ability to understand what it is we're dealing with and to come up with a vaccine that we desperately need and that it would be one that would work and that we would see it uh, as a gift from you that you would use as an instrument in your hand to answer the prayer to stem the tide of this virus. And Lord, God, we pray for our leaders, how difficult it must be to make the decisions and know that half the people will agree and half the people will not. I pray you'd grant them wisdom not to do what is politically expedient, but instead that which is right and that which is good. And for we as a church, that we would be able to do the same thing because we're basing our decisions on where you are leading us to go and what your word reveals to us in principle and in very explicit ways. So, Father, help us. And as we open your word here in just a moment, that you would speak to us that you would give us an understanding of the text that we study this morning. And as we do so, that we would see you and see you as you truly are, the divine Son of God. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, today we continue our study of the Gospel of Mark. And as we do, we come to an account where we see people having different opinions of who Jesus Christ is. And people have always had a lot of opinions of the identity of Jesus Christ. In the world today, we think of uh, individuals within Judaism. Their opinion of Jesus Christ is different from ours. He is not the Son of God. He is not the Messiah. He is, if anything, a failed Messiah and a, and a false teacher. When you think of those who live in the religion of Islam, they consider Jesus to be a good man, a great man, but not an immortal one, not the son of God. He is a prophet, the second of all the prophets that have come to the earth. And they look forward to the day that this Jesus Christ that they think they know will come once again to usher in a new age. The billions of people who call themselves Hindus consider Jesus to be a holy man a wise man, a God to be sure, but just one of another of the millions of gods that they worship. Individuals who consider themselves to be Buddhists, again, that he is an enlightened man, a, a very advanced man, a very wise teacher, worthy of all investigation into the truths that he teaches. Here in America, we're probably familiar with Mormons. Mormons who believe that Jesus Christ was the the firstborn spiritual child of, of God and uh, a spiritual woman, uh, a heavenly father and a heavenly mother who one day uh, would come to earth in a physical form in the body of Mary. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses created by God named Jehovah as the archangel Michael uh, before the world was began, uh, a lesser being than God, but as close to God as you can get without being God. And, and when he did come to earth, there was no such thing as any physical resurrection. And then, of course, we have Christians. What do we think? Well, we think he's the divine son of God who was born of the virgin and lived life as a human, the very God-man who died on the cross and rose from the dead and now lives forever, interceding for those who put their trust in him. And that he indeed is coming back one day. To, in, in, to bring the new world into being. You know, we would all hate to be so misunderstood. And there's no person in the history of the world who's been more misunderstood than Jesus Christ. And often so by those who loved him the most and knew him the best. And we see today in the verses we begin study of even the misunderstanding that takes place within the members of his own family. I want to invite you to turn with me to the third chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And beginning in verse 20, we see this, this un misunderstanding of his own family, his brothers, his sisters, about who Jesus Christ really is. 
In verses 20 and 21 of Mark chapter 3, we read these words. Then he, Jesus, went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Here we see how his family misunderstands who Jesus is. They thought that he was delusional. They've just come back, Jesus and his newly formed apostles, this group of 12 men who would be with him until the very end, and they've decided to come home. This would be Capernaum, the place where Jesus made his base of operations and trying to get away maybe from the chaos that we looked at last week in verses 7 through 12 but it appears the chaos has simply followed them back home to Capernaum and now they're in a place where they're trying to rest and trying to gain their strength by enjoying a meal but the crowd is so forceful upon them that they were not even able to eat that's again we see most of the time when a crowd is mentioned in the gospel of mark it has a, a negative connotation it's keeping jesus from doing what he needs to do or keeping others away from jesus and that's just like a crowd today that might see a celebrity somewhere in a restaurant and not allow them to enjoy their meal in peace, but to go up one after the other and, can I have your autograph? And, sir, I'm a great fan. And, and how the crowd thinks only of themselves in moments like that. But we see the crowd is not alone. The crowd is added to by a certain number of people that we see in verse 21 called his family. That's a very generic term, and we have no idea what members of his family actually are there. But we imagine that they've heard of what Jesus has been doing. They've heard about his exploits and what he's been saying. And now they heard that he's finally come back close to their home. He's in Capernaum. They're down in Nazareth, about 25 miles away, but close enough to go and find him and bring him home. It seems they've heard words uh, about what Jesus Christ is doing. And, and they're able to make one conclusion in verse 21. They think... He's crazy. They say that he is out of his mind. That seems almost impossible for us to consider thinking like that, but imagine what it must have been like for them to grow up in the household of an older brother, Jesus. And yes, to know that he was a, a very polite young man, a very nice young man, a very well-mannered individual, a, a very spiritually astute individual who, who loved the Word of God and who always seemed to have the right answers, never, though, really did anything outstanding. The, the Bible tells us, you remember when we went through Isaiah, that there was nothing about him that would make us think that he was different from anybody else. Uh, but just this, you know, that one time in Jerusalem where he was at 12 years old and talking to the teachers of the law, but most of us in our family, we have that one kid, that brother, that sister, that always has the right answer in Sunday school. It, we don't really ever think that he's God. But here, now, they've heard that this older brother who left home just a little while ago, and you're starting to hear the reports. Have you heard about your brother? Have you heard about your older brother that he's going around forgiving sins, not sins uh, against him, but everyone sins against everyone else? And saying that I forgive you, that he's arguing with our spiritual leaders, the leaders that we've been taught to respect and to listen to all our lives. That he's, he's hanging around some of the, the worst individuals in the nation. He's hanging around with tax collectors and with prostitutes and with sinners. What's happened to your brother? He's even, they've even heard that he's gone around declaring himself to, to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And even claiming the title of the son of, son of man, this divine title that the prophet Daniel used of this coming Messiah. What is going on? He's got individuals who have given up everything they've had to start following him. And these are not the individuals that you would want to be following you. And, and all of this, it has the makings of what his brother surely thought was what we would call a, a personality cult. That individuals were looking to him to, to be some type of savior, some type of Messiah, something that he certainly was not. For all they knew, it was a first century Waco or a, a first century Guyana. So they only had two options. Thinking about the Jesus that they know and the Jesus that they're hearing about. It would appear that Jesus was either a religious huckster 
who had figured out how to draw a crowd and, and how to maybe enrich himself from that crowd, or their brother has simply lost his grip on reality. And so with only those two options, the, the only thing they can do is to go and try to, as it says in verse 21, to seize him. And this is a, a violent term. It's the, it's the type of seizing that happened to Jesus by the mob when he was in the garden of the Gethsemane. They didn't come to reason with him. They didn't come to try to talk to him or persuade him. They came to take him by force. This is a, a difficult episode for us to put our minds around, but th this is one of those accounts in the scripture that really give us reason to trust that the Bible we read is the word of God. This is something that you simply just would not put in here unless it actually have happened. It's telling everything. They're not airbrushing anything. They're not trying to make something better than it was. Some individuals through the years have tried to do that. We have some ancient manuscripts where this verse, these two verses are removed from them because it was embarrassing. But in the vast majority of manuscripts we have, it's there. And so we know this has happened. This is, this is true. And at this point, Jesus' family has decided enough is enough. They've come to take him violently, if need be, and take him back to Nazareth, this small little backwoods town where he can indulge his fantasies and privacy and no longer bring shame to this family. And then instantly we see in verse 22 uh, another group who also misunderstands Jesus. His family misunderstands, thinking that he is delusional. But here we see in verse 22 some scribes who have come down from Jerusalem. And they misunderstand who Jesus is because they think that he is demonic. Look what it says in verse 22. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. Now these are something between a, a, theolo a theology professor and a, a lawyer. Individuals who knew the word of God well and were the ones called upon to act when people broke the law of God. It appears now that the stories about Jesus Christ have reached all the way to Jerusalem and a delegation has come back to, to put an end to all of this. This seems to be the, the part of the plot that was hatched way back up in verse 6 when the Pharisees went out and began to plot in order that they might destroy him. And it seems like the first way they came up with to destroy him is to try to discredit him to come back and spread lies about him, to come back and, and, and speak myths, truths about him so that people would look at him in a different way. And this is wildly out of proportion for what Jesus is doing. This is like calling some of the, the greatest theologians in the world from some of the, the leading seminaries in the country to come to North Iredell to, to deal with an upstart young Sunday school teacher who's got a following all of a sudden. It seems wildly out of proportion for them to do so. And when they show up, it appears they showed up with their minds already made up. There's no investigation that we see. There's no interviews that are conducted. It seems they don't want to be confused with the facts and instead have come up to engage in what we would call negative political ads. When you can't deal with the person's record, when you can't handle what the person has done, the only thing left for you to do is to begin to attack the person. We can almost imagine the ads coming across our television screens, don't follow Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Instead, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And this, this voice that would make Jesus seem so fearful and scary. He's possessed by the devil and it is only by his allegiance with the devil that he's actually able to cast out the demons. And so they're making these two wild accusations about Christ, that he's possessed by the devil, by the Lord of all spirits, which Jesus says uh, a little bit later here in verse 23 to be synonymous with Satan himself. Then it says that he gets his power from Satan. 
It's interesting to note that they don't deny what's been happening. They know something supernatural has been happening, but it could not. There's no way it could have been from God, and so it must instead be from Satan. He did truly do exorcisms. They cannot deny that. They can't say he's a fraud. Instead, they make him out to be a liar, one who claims to be from God but actually is in league with Satan himself. And so we have these two great misunderstandings that Jesus Christ is deluded and that he is demonic. And beginning in verse 23 down through 27, we see Jesus answer first these Jewish leaders. Read with me in verse 23. After being accused of possessed by Beelzebul and, and acting in the power of Satan himself, in verse 23, Jesus called them, his accusers, to him, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. Here we see Jesus dealing with the charge that he's a liar, that he's satanic, that he's demonic, that he's possessed. And, and he deals with his accusation through the very simplest of logic that is also at the very same time completely irrefutable. It's an incredibly simple argument that he's making, but it leaves his accusers mute at the end of his argument. And, and it shows the, the, the absurdity that those who are against Jesus Christ will go. That they will embrace any argument as credible, however impossible that argument might be, as long as they're able to hold firm to their own pre-commitments and their own understanding and their own rebellion. And we know that that happens even today as atheists today on the internet and in books, they continue to make the same tired arguments again and again and again. Arguments that have been disproven and dealt with hundreds of times, but continue going to them again and again, clinging desperately, frantically to these arguments as an excuse for why they live the life that they do. And Jesus answered these wild accusations by the simple logic of saying, why would Satan do that? If, if it is by Satan's power that I am casting Satan out, why would Satan do that? There, there's no general in any army that calls an attack upon his own position or his own men. Satan may be evil, Jesus says, but Satan is not stupid. If he where any kingdom, he goes from the greater down to the lesser. If a, if a kingdom is divided, that kingdom will fall from within. If a house is divided, that house will soon disintegrate and fall. And if an individual, even one like Satan, is divided against himself, trying to advance while also hurting himself at the same time, then he himself cannot stand. Their accusations are baseless and silly. And he shows them to be what they really are. But he does give them an alternate explanation. Something is happening. Something very supernatural is happening. They try to explain it in one way. And in verse 27, Jesus explains it the true way. In verse 27, it begins with the word but. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. There again, there's no sense in denying what's happening. They've seen it with their own eyes. Jesus has healed people. A crippled was lowered into a house. A man with a withered hand, his hand was healed. Jesus has seen demons being driven out from demon-possessed individuals. They've seen it. They cannot deny it. So something is happening, and Jesus says this is what is happening. In his little uh, metaphor, he, he, he says no one can enter a strong man's house. The, the strong man in this illustration is Satan himself. The house that the strong man owns is Satan's kingdom. It's the world in, in which we live. 
The, the goods that are to be plundered are those who are under Satan's control, those who are part of his kingdom that, that serve him, however unwittingly it may be. And then, of course, we see one who is stronger, who comes into the strong man's house to take from the strong man to himself. Now, who can do that? Only one who is stronger than the strong man. Satan's kingdom is being destroyed bit by bit. Satan's kingdom is being, it, it, uh, uh, they, they're advancing against it. And they are engaged in war against it. And his kingdom will one day fall, but it's not going to fall from within. It's not going to fall because it is divided. It's going to fall because Jesus Christ is invading that kingdom and he is winning the battle against that kingdom for the kingdom of God. He is engaged in a rescue operation to come down and invade the kingdom of Satan, the, the house of the strong man, and he's binding up that strong man to take the plunder from the strong man's house and to take out what is most important. And only Jesus Christ can do this because Jesus is stronger than the strong man himself. That's the whole point of what Jesus is doing. That's the whole point of Jesus' healing of people and exorcism of people so that he can show that he is the strong one. In John's first letter, he actually says this, that the, the reason the Son of God appeared is to destroy the works of the devil. And this is, the, this is the nail in the coffin of that standard understanding or misunderstanding of Jesus that he's just a good teacher. That doesn't explain why he does what he does, that, that we need more than just an education if we're going to defeat death. We need more than just an education if we hope to, to escape from the one who holds us captive in his house and we are bound there. Before he can teach us, he must rescue us. And by, way back in Genesis, the Bible says that one is coming who will crush the head of the serpent. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing right now. That's why as we go on into Jesus' life, as we end the nearer, nearer into the cross, these 12 men that we studied last week begin to, to really begin to be confused because they see what Jesus is doing. They understand maybe what Jesus is saying here, that, that Jesus is plundering the house of the strong man. But then we see at the cross that it appears the strong man has rebounded. The strong man has gotten strength and he's coming after the stronger one. They not understand that the stronger man, by going to the cross, is not defeated but laying down his life as part of his plan so that those whom he has rescued can be rescued, not just in this world, but in the world to come by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see Jesus answer the argument of the Jewish leaders that he is demonic. He said that's ridiculous. Instead, he's making the case that he is divine and Lord over the demonic realm. And then he gets into verses 28, 29, and 30. And we, we don't have time to do this well. I, I wanted to cover these, but there's just not enough time. This is uh, a warning that he's giving to these Jewish leaders. If you continue to say what you're saying in spite of everything that you've seen and heard, in spite of the reality that is before you, if you continue to engage in that type of misunderstanding of who I am, then there's no hope for you. And he says, essentially, you have committed a sin, an eternal sin for which there is no forgiveness. This unpardonable sin is what they have committed. I want to come back next week and deal with verses 28, 29, and 30 a little bit more in depth. Because I know there are people listening, there are people in this church who often are convicted and they feel the, the guilt and the pressure wondering, have I committed this unpardonable sin? Can I? Is it possible for me to commit this, impossible, this unpardonable sin? And so I want to take care of that beginning next week. And so we move on to verse 31. After dealing and answering the misunderstanding of the Jewish leaders that he is demonic, he comes back and he comes back to his family. In verse 31, and he answers their misunderstanding. In Mark chapter 3, verse 31. His mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, 
Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. He, he's, re, he's returned to the issue of his family. And what he's trying to do, what Mark's trying to do here in putting the material in this order is, is linking these two levels of skepticism, these two levels of doubt, these two types of misunderstanding into to one story. And, and what Mark's trying to show us here is that those who appear to be on the inside are the ones who actually are on the outside. And those who appear by all appearances to be on the outside with no chance of entering in, they are the ones who actually are on the inside. Look what he says in verse 31. His mother and his brothers came and standing outside, outside of this house where he's trying to eat that is filled with all of these outsiders but yet they themselves are on the outside. And, and the word is passed. We, we can't get in and say, tell them, tell, tell Jesus that his family's outside. And it just went down the line until finally in the center of the room, Jesus Christ heard the word, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside. And, and Jesus does something that is a lot more shocking to the original audience than it is, uh, is us. It's still kind of surprising to hear these words. It sounds so incredibly dishonorable. But Jesus is not rejecting his family. What he's getting ready to do is establish a, a new family, one that's not based on ethnicity, one that's not based on blood, one that's not based on any physical aspect of your life, one that's not based on your nationality, or, but instead is one that is based only on who you understand Jesus to be. And so he says in a rhetorical question, who are my mother and my brothers. And here he's teaching who his true family is. If his family persists in thinking that he's deluded, that he's crazy or demonic or not the Messiah or not the Savior, not the divine Son of God, then they are not part of his spiritual family. But those who are not related to him in any way, Jew or Gentile, who understand him to be who he says that he is and who he shows himself to be. He says, these are the ones who are my family. <clears throat> Based on a, a common allegiance to God of understanding who Jesus Christ is and his purpose. And the sign that you are a member of that family is not that you look the same or talk the same or, or have the same family tree. But instead, he says in verse 35, these are the ones who are my mother and my brother. Whoever does the will of God, he is my family. We enter into that family by faith, but the distinction that we carry that shows we're part of that family is that we do the will of God, that we very intentionally, very purposefully live our lives in obedience to the commands of God. That's what marks us out, and that's exactly what Jesus tells us that's exactly what the scriptures tell us john says that if we obey him we will if we follow him if we are his we will obey his commands this is how everyone knows that we belong to jesus that we do what he says but this this whole redefinition of the family is such a a great hope to so many of us many follow jesus have come from the outside and now find themselves on the inside because of jesus christ and their physical family have disowned them. It's a great risk to be a Christian in many parts of the world. And it's a great risk in some ways to follow Jesus Christ in this part of the world. There are many in this church, there are many who may be listening now who have suffered because they have become part of the family of God, a family that is superior to any physical family that they have. It's superior because it is eternal, it is stronger, it is more satisfying and it is more dear. And it's a family that we know instinctively, that we know instantly. There are many in this church that have gone around the world and have met perfect strangers, 
only to find a kinship with them that they miss with their own physical family. There's even a young man that's been watching uh, on the internet from India the last several weeks. Uh, a man that many in our church met on past trips to India, a man named Hamilton Harold. He shows up almost every Sunday, and I, I love to see our people interact with a man they don't even know. But by virtue of knowing and by what he types and what he says and what others, how others treat him, they know he must be one of ours. He must be a family member. He must be a brother in Christ. And that bond that we have with someone we've never even met is one that's often so much stronger than the bonds that have been severed because of our faith in Christ with those that we belong to by blood. And I think every single one of us realized that over the last eight weeks. During this time of quarantine, many of us have been with our physical family for eight weeks, but we've missed the family that perhaps we love even more, the family of God that sits in these chairs on Sunday mornings, the family that we share not by blood but by the blood of Christ that unites us in a way that will never be dissolved and will last for all eternity. And we're all united only because of what we think of Christ. And what we think of Christ will determine whether we are on the inside or whether we are on the outside. It doesn't matter what your family is. It doesn't matter what your church is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity or your race or your heritage or your nationality. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is what you think of Jesus Christ. And do you understand him correctly? Many years ago, there's a man that most of you are familiar with by the name of C.S. Lewis, a brilliant man. He embraced atheism at the age of 15. And as he began to teach at Oxford, he was drawn to the intellects of some of his fellow professors. And they were used by God to, to draw C.S. Lewis to himself. And, and he was converted to Christianity and became a great advocate for the Christian faith, writing so many of the classics that we still enjoy. And one of the things he's very well known for is something that we call the, the trilemma. You're familiar probably with a dilemma, uh, a decision between two choices. This is a trilemma where you have three choices. He did not invent this argument, but he's the one that probably made it more famous than anyone else. And it's one you might have recognized as we worked our way through this text where we said Jesus Christ is either deluded or demonic or he's divine. In Lewis's argument, he uses a more familiar phrase that he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Some people argue, well, there's a fourth possibility that maybe he's just a legend. Uh, but that's more silly than the other three. There's absolutely no way that Jesus Christ could take on this category of legend in such a short period of time. The individuals were still alive when these stories were being told about Jesus. And they could have easily refuted. And so it's ridiculous to say that Jesus Christ was merely a legend. But it's just as ridiculous to say that Jesus Christ was a lunatic. Lunatics can't heal withered hands. Lunatics can't raise people from the dead. He's certainly not a liar. There's no way a liar could get people to, to listen to him and, and think what he says is true and actually live his life backing up what he says, to live such an exemplary moral life in every way and persuade others that he, in fact, has no sin, including the sin of lying. No, if he's not a legend, if he's not a liar, and if he's not a lunatic, then C.S. Lewis is right. The only way to understand who Jesus Christ is is to see what Mark has been trying to show from the very beginning of this book, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is divine. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and we must understand him rightly. And if you understand Jesus as Mark has presented him to us, Though you may be the outsider, you can be brought to the inside. And if you, can, if you refuse, if you refuse to understand Jesus for who he is, even though you might consider yourself an insider, you will forever be on the outside. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us to understand Jesus Christ rightly. 
as he's revealed in scriptures, that he is the eternal son of God, the second person of the Trinity, fully God and fully man, come to earth to live a perfect and sinless life as a man born of a virgin and raised in the first century on this earth, only to die a death that he did not deserve, but yet to be raised to eternal life so that all who put their trust in his life, death, and resurrection can live forever. Thank you, Lord, for making people like us, outsiders, unworthy to be brought into your family. And we cherish forever what you have done for us. May you work in the hearts and minds of all who are listening and draw them to yourself, to the inside, and to your family. We pray this in his name. Amen. God bless. Thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day.